Principle of Microeconomics, Chapter 9, A Monopoly. We're going to talk about how monopolies form and how a profit-maximizing monopoly chooses output and price. Okay, the, one of the illustrations of monopoly is the political power derived from a cop monopoly. Uh, 1860, the United States uh, had a near monopoly uh, of cotton supplied to Great Britain. These uh, states tried to uh, leverage this economic power to political power, swaying Great Britain to formally recognize Confederate States of America. Monopoly is, as the word sounds, it would be one firm that produces all the output in the given market. A barrier of entry are legal, technological, or market forces that discourage or prevent competition from entering a market. So let's say it would be a lot easier to open up a, uh, let's say, a, a burger, you know, burger, you know, franchise than, let's say, uh, building, you know, going ahead and getting into the hospital business. So the barrier of entries would be significantly different. Certainly a uh, barrier of entry to getting into the hospital market is probably the quantity of capital needed, licensing, and you know a whole myriad of other things that would prevent you know people just jumping into that marketplace. Whereas a burger franchise, much simpler. And so that barrier to entry would be substantially less. A natural monopoly exists where the barrier of entries are something other than a legal pre, pre you know, hope, bleh, pre, prohibition. Okay, legal monopoly laws prohibit or severely limit competition. So usually that would be, in many countries, a state-owned entity. It could be a railway. It could be an airline. It could be a postal telephone telegraph, which is basically the communications of a country where there's no free competition allowed. Natural monopolies occur in an industry with a marginal cost of adding additional customers very low. Once the fixed costs and overall system are in place, in smaller markets for products that are difficult to transport, and also when a company has uh, control of a scarce physical resource. So if you're the only guy in town that has control of the diamond market, such as the beers in South Africa, um, pretty much, you know, they have a near monopoly on, on diamonds. They do, uh, they do you know, get mined in other places, but everybody knows the beers. So those would be considered some natural monopolies because you know you can only mine diamonds where they exist and there are very few places so De Beers has made sure that they have you know their footprint in just about every place they mine them. Economies of scale and natural monopoly and so in this market the demand curve And intersects the long range average cost at its downward sloping spot. So there's price one and price two, and these would be the outputs. A natural monopoly occurs when the quantity demanded is less than the minimum quantity to be at the bottom of the long range average cost curve. And that's illustrated here. Okay, examples of legal monopolies, as I was talking about before, postal service. Uh, that's true in just about every country we call it. Uh, PTTs or postal telephone telegraphs. Uh, many, many countries, Europe and uh, otherwise, that's pretty much state owned. Utilities, water, garbage, maybe likewise, at least owned uh, regionally uh, and probably managed by the city. There are things promoting innovation, however, and so these are th things that people use to uh, protect 
you know, protect their invention or their discovery. And so patents, I give an inventor an exclusive right to make or use the invention for a limited time. Very typically, that could be anywhere from seven to 20 years. Trademark is identifying a symbol or name for a particular good. Probably one of the most famous trademarks as an example is, is Coca-Cola. Everybody knows what that looks like. It's been around for 125 years and uh, it's a it's a brand that people stay you know people don't mess with them on that copyright is you know legal protection from preventing copying for commercial purposes so that could be intellectual or it could be uh, you know authorship books music whatever uh, basically not without the express permission of the person who created the work are you able to reproduce it? Trade secrets are methods of production kept secret by the producing firm. And believe it or not, there's you know some corporate espionage you know taking place between firms because they want to know what the other guys do on so they can you know get a little, you know a little bit of a leg up on their competition. Intellectual property, it's a, the whole business of laws that, you know, include the patents, trademarks, and copyrights to protect the right, you know, so it falls under that. And basically it applies ownership over an idea, concept, or an image, not a physical piece of property. Uh, software is pretty much an idea, a technology that, you know, the con you know, concept behind that technology could be protected. Uh, this is something that uh, China has been regularly accused of stealing from the U.S. Whether you know, either through the you know trade you know current trade you know agreements, which are trying to you know, they're trying to change that right now uh, with the you know the use of tariffs and other things, and so we don't necessarily want to surrender all of our technological secrets to do business with China. So. That's probably the most glaring example. Uh, deregulation, uh, removing government controls over setting prices and quantities in certain industries. And so they, what they do is like uh, back in 1984, when you know, there was uh, the Bell system, they were nearly government owned. Uh, they were a monopoly, a telephone monopoly. Everybody had to deal with them. And in 1984, there was an antitrust suit brought against the tele, you know, Bell, and they had to split up into different companies, and they did. They split up into AT&T. The Bell split up into smaller, you know, versions of themselves, and they were more regionalized. Other players got into the game, like MCI, WorldCom, and Sprint, and others. So. Uh, this was a move that stimulated or created competition in a relatively static market. And so if you have to sum up barriers to entry, I think this, this would be a nice little table to have uh, an understanding of. Probably we'll see this on the test. Predatory pricing. This is something that happens where a firm you know, uses sharp price cuts to discourage uh, competition. It's a violation of the antitrust law, but it's difficult to, improve, to prove. Well, this could also be a global situation, and I like to use what's going on today. So Soviet, well, Russia and the Saudis are having a price war. So bear of oil cost around $20, which is been unseen and unheard of for at least 40 years and so the idea is they're trying to get price other people out other competition maybe like the US uh, you know drilling you know drilling companies you know because it really uh, the reasonable price to produce a barrel of oil is somewhere around $45 I've heard and so at 22 it's real cutthroat and you know for reasons we discussed earlier, uh, it would make sense for those energy firms that couldn't make a profit at this rate to at least shut down, at least temporarily, which leads to layoffs and other things. 
and there will be some bankruptcies involved in this. So it is a it's a bit of a game. Uh, there is such thing as cheap gas, and then there's such thing as too cheap of gas, and uh, a lot of people are getting hurt by this. Profit maximizing monopolies choose their output and price. Since they can charge any price for its product, demand for the furnace product will uh, constrain the price. Because if that's, uh, you know, if it's, you know, too pricey, regardless if they're only guys in town to have it, uh, people will be forced to avoid it because they just simply can't find the money. Uh, now, because the monopolist is the only firm in the market, the demand curve is the same as a market demand curve. So, you know, it's like the Mylan Corporation charging $600 for an EpiPen. So school districts and other institutions who are required to have such, uh, you know, things on hand in their, in their uh, first aid kits, you know, they have to replace them every six months. It's kind of falls under the predatory pricing thing. So that's made the news and there's been a big stink over it and I believe it's been remedied since. And so we have, you know, perceived demand curve for a competitor and a monopolist. And so the left hand side, we have perceived demand that's horizontal. And then over to the right and perceived demand for monopolist is you see the perceived demand curve going downward. So actually I'm gonna revise in graph A, it's a competitive, perfectly competitive firm. Does not necessarily mean it's a monopoly. So this is the perfectly, this is for the perfect competitor, this one's for the monopolist. The continuation on this idea, of uh, the monopolist demand curve is the same as the market demand curve for most goods, which it's downward slope, and you can see that here. So if the monopolist chooses a high level output, it can ch charge only a relatively low price. So if they decide to crank up the volume, uh, they're gonna have to ask something less of the product in order for people to be in incented to buy it. Conversely, if he chooses to do the opposite and he restricts the production of the product, naturally it's going to gain a higher price. A challenge for the monopolist is to find out what, you know, what the best combination is. So we call that a, you know, Pareto optimal situation where all things, you know, you know, the best, you know, best possible outcome can be achieved by uh, a set number of production at a set price where you can get the most profit. Total cost and total revenue for a monopolist. Total cost rises as output increases. Highest profit will occur at the quantity where total revenue is farthest above the total cost. So here's an illustration. Total revenue and total cost for health pill monopoly. And so you have the total revenue as it you know first rises and then it'll begin to fall after a certain point <coughs> so this is the total revenue curve low levels of output being in relatively little total revenues because the quantity is low high levels of output bring in less revenue because the high quantity pushes uh, the price downward so the total cost curve is upward is upward, upward. This is very important to remember right here. So the profits will be highest when the distance between these two lines is the greatest. And once again, calculus would probably be used to figure out what the maximus is. And with respect to the distance of these two curves, but visually speaking, somewhere around four and a half at 4,000. That's pretty much, you know, that look, you know, just intuitively, that would be the most profit. So that, so it's the, big, the biggest gap between here and here. That's to remember. You got marginal re revenue and cost for a monopolist in the real world. He doesn't really ha always have enough information to, to uh, analyze the total revenue and cost curves 
Burn doesn't really know exactly what happened if it was to alter its production dramatically. However, uh, he has if, uh, he often has fairly reliable information about changing outputs you know, by small or moderate amounts. So he can kind of tweak it and figure out you know how it'll affect marginal revenues and costs. And of course, marginal uh, profit is basically the profit of one more unit of output computed as a marginal revenue minus a marginal cost. So basically the delta of marginal revenue against marginal cost would give you your marginal profit. Well, an illustration of that concept, health bill, but the marginal revenue decreases as it sells additional units of output. So we have marginal revenue is downward sloping here. In this particular case, marginal cost curve is upward sloping here. So the profit maximizing choice is where MR equals MC. So this would be the maximum possible profit. So once again, the graph shows at this given point here, that's the maximum profit where the marginal revenues are equal to the marginal cost. So if the monopoly produces a lower quantity, the marginal revenues are greater at those level output, they can make higher profits by expanding output. So essentially, they can, if they are producing here, yeah, they're making profits, all right, but they'll maximize it if they go ahead and move the production, you know, from one to five. Now, if the firm produces a greater quantity where the marginal, where the marginal uh, revenue is less than the cost, naturally, a uh, firm can make higher profits only if they reduce. So they would, so if they were producing at seven, you know, you know, seven, well, they'd be making nothing. And down here at eight, they'd be losing money. That's not uh, exactly what businesses are for. So they're going to go back to their, what we call a Pareto optimal point of equilibrium where they can make the maximum profit. And so in terms of illustrating profits at the health bill company, or monopoly rather, uh, what, they, you know, what they're going to do is first choose a quantity where MR equals MC of 5. And that's where that is. And so this would be your total profit. This area underneath, this dark purplish area, represents the total revenue for the firm. Whereas in this slide, the small lighter shaded box represents total cost. And so if you subtract the area of this one from the area of that one, that would show your total profits. And since the price charge is above the average cost, the firm is indeed earning positive profits. Okay, profit maximizing monopolies deciding prices. How do they do that? Step one, they'll determine its profit maximizing level of output. They'll decide what price to charge and then calculate the total revenue, total uh, cost, and come up with the profit number. Okay, step one, how do they do this? Step one, first off, they identify where MR equals MC. And then step two, they look at the demand curve to see what kind of price they could charge for that quantity of production. And so let's decide how much to charge by drawing a line straight up from Q1 to point R. So that would be from here to here. And that's how they come up with price one. How a profit maximizing monopoly decides price, you know, we're going to go ahead and carry this a bit further. 
Okay, total revenue will be multiplied by Q1 by P1. So you multiply this number by that number. And the total cost will be Q. Okay, the total cost will be Q1 multiplied times the average cost of producing Q1, which point S shows uh, the average cost to be P2. So right here, that's your average cost curve. So that's that. So that determines price two. And so the shaded zone would be your, you know, your, would be your, your total revenue rectangle. So this is the total revenue. Here, the monopolist revenue curve versus the demand curve. So you have the two curves. Because the market demand curve is conditional, the market, market revenue curve for monopolist lies beneath the demand curve. Allocative efficiency with respect to monopolies, they tend to be inefficient. Producing the optimal quantity of some output, the quantity where the marginal benefit to society of one unit just equals the marginal cost. That would be allocative efficiencies, but uh, monopolies very often tend not to do that. End of chapter nine.